Yeah, my name is Ivan Stead. I'm an, an economist at the Department for Transport, working in the Transport Appraisal and Strategic Modelling Division, primarily on de developing the apartments appraisal guidance contained within TAG, what was formerly known as Web Tag, and I'm going to give a talk about the accessibility guidance within that t today. Yeah, uh, so just a quick overview. I'm going to talk a bit about how we define accessibility in our guidance tag, um, and then how it's used both for appraisal and a case study of how it's used in land use planning in the UK. And I'm then going to go on to talk around some some bandies around accessibility from recent DFT commissioned research and then go on to conclude with some signals about ongoing and future work in the department on this topic. Hey, I just want to say what TAG stands for, just in case somebody doesn't know. Yeah, the TAG stands for Transport Analysis Guidance, and it's our official CBA guidelines in the UK, as well as guidance for transport modelling. Um, so, to start off with, how do we define and appraise accessibility in TAG? So, to start off with here, I've just got two um, headline conceptions of this, which actually come from... Um, the, the paper which my colleagues presented a couple of years ago, Jago Penrose and James Canton, and this, so there's two notions in that paper of what accessibility means, which is the ease at which people in place are connected, and the usability of the transport system for people with physical and hidden disabilities. I think the theme of this workshop is very much focusing um, on the first of those, or, although I, I will touch on the second um, briefly in a minute. Um, so just to give a definition from the guidance, um, and I'll get, before I move on to this, more of the practicalities, um, accessibility can be used to signify the range of opportunities and choices people have in connecting jobs, services, family and friends in a timely and affordable manner. And this takes into account um, land use, where people choose to live, where services or the destinations they want to visit are located, uh, as well as the availability, affordability and speed of transport options, and that's the primarily um, that's that's the primary notion of accessibility. I'm going to talk about uh, rather than this narrower but related concept of, um, of accessibility for those users who have um, some form of disability which encumbers travel. Um, so, just to highlight some examples of how we've used statistics in the past to help identify weaknesses in the UK's infrastructure. So, these charts on the right-hand side from the recent transport investment strategy. I'm afraid they're a bit, they're a bit small to make out. The, but this, this, this sets out the rationale and high-level plans um, by the UK government for investment in the transport system as a whole. It was published last year. Um, and you can see there that, that, that there's quite a spread and actually regional disparity in some ways in, in terms of um, accessibility to major employment centres by public transport. So that's what the first... Um, map of, of the right hand pane shows and then uh, again if you look at the same map of accessibility by car um, as highlighted from some of the previous presentations there, there there's a much greater um, level of accessibility by car as you might expect um, I won't dwell on, on, on the other maps which show a similar picture um, for bus service but happy to go back to those later um, so I mentioned the transport investment strategy it's probably worth talking about our inclusive transport strategy as well um, which was also published last year and it specifically makes a number of commitments um, with regards to accessibility for disabled travellers and I just thought I'd pick out a few sort of choice commitments which, the, which that actually makes on behalf of the government so one is this strategy will help ensure that rail passengers uh, with accessibility requirements will be confident to travel uh, on the bus side it, it, it makes a similar commitment ensure that passengers are comfortable to travel um, and on, on the taxi side we would like the service provided to disabled passengers to be as good as those who aren't disabled. So that's just an example with one particular segment um, of, of, of passengers where the notion of accessibility uh, is at the centre, really, of some really important commitments by the government with regards to maintaining or improving that level of accessibility. If I now turn to the question of how we actually measure and account for accessibility, I don't think this has been said in, in certain terms yet, so I wanted to get this um, quite clearly out there because it's quite fundamental in underpinning our appraisal approach. So in an idealised setting, and I think this is a highly idealised setting where you can imagine you have 
in a sense, a perfect model which accounts for all available modes, all available destinations, a fully comprehensive model of choice of travellers, then actually it has been shown, um, there's this paper reference there by um, John Bates and David Simmons that was produced for the department in 1997, that the measure of change in accessibility is equivalent to the measure of change in user benefit. So if we considered both on on, on same terms in, in an appraisal context, that would be entirely tied double counting. So look at this purely few a CBA lens. Um, there's a, a huge amount of overlap between the concepts of accessibility and user benefits. However, that doesn't preclude a number of important areas where you can conceive of additional benefits arising um, from accessibility. So one of these might be flexibility value, um, which essentially relates to the idea that as um, people's accessibility needs evolve throughout their life cycle, um, they might value the flexibility of having different transport options available to them where they choose to locate that they may take advantage of later in their life. And it's unlikely that most sort of more, more static models used to um, analyse transport investments would account for sort of some of the flexibility value. So that's just, just one example of how, while in this ideal scenario, I think there is an equivalence between accessibility and user benefits. You, you can conceive of ways in which it's still useful to look at accessibility on its own terms in, in the CBA sense. Um, so now, just to sort of exemplify that with a diagram, uh, this picks different aspects which we, which we look at within our transport appraisal guidance. Um, I've drawn a big circle of accessibility and a smaller circle of user benefits, um, so it's, it's a Venn diagram, and you can see that accessibility essentially, as I've said it up here, contains all those elements which we typically look at in appraising user benefits in the UK, but it also um, brings in a, a number of wider considerations which we routinely assess in appraisal, which I'll go on to explain just now. Um, so while user benefits capture the benefit um, value individuals place on um, quicker journeys, including some more attractive destinations. Um, there are a more holistic set of considerations which we bring to bear in accessibility appraisal. So that in, in particular um, in includes the availability and physical accessibility of public transport, the cost or the affordability of the transport system, um, safety, security and travel horizons. Yep, of course. I just didn't understand why those other things weren't, couldn't be included in the normal use. I mean, I mean cost of transport, for example, that's normally included in, in, in use of benefits, right? Affordability of transport. Um, I, I suggest that it might be better to just let Ivan continue with the presentation, because once we start discussing the elements, it'll go off and he won't get to the end. Keep, keep a note of the points. We'll, we'll have time for them. Travel cost is included in user benefits. This might help explain a bit, Jonas. Um, so within TAG, actually, the appraisal accessibility is primarily seen through a distributional lens. So it's about understanding um, the pattern of accessibility for particular identified groups. So we have a number of, I don't want to use the word vulnerable, but kind of groups where we think there might be a particular issue of accessibility within society. So they're listed there, includes young people, older people, disabled, minority groups, carers. And our guidance actually advises essentially using an isochrone-based approach, i.e. looking at travel times to key destinations, um, that scheme promoters have to consider um, the, the impacts for these groups of accessibility by public transport to key destinations. So that is kind of narrowing things down quite substantially. So it's not affecting the aggregate assessment of benefits, it's just looking at the distributional effects on these certain groups. It's only looking at public transport and it, again it's looking at this pre-selected list of amenities and primarily GIS um, based tools are used to carry out this this assessment the, or, and the accessibility audit component. Uh, there's an example there of a, of, of a real life accessibility assessment for a um, airport relief road in Manchester. Um, Probably worth note of interest, actually, in quite a lot of appraisals in, in the UK, this, this impact is actually screened out of the appraisal, so you won't find lots of cases where this is actually done, um, and there's various sort of reasons in the guidance why you might screen it out on grounds of proportionality. It's just something worth noting is it's not um, always actually taken, taken forward. Um, so 
if you imagine you've done this isochrome based analysis, you've used some GIS tools to map the access to key destinations for these different groups. I, a particular group also is no car versus car households. Uh, that's of particular interest. Um, and I think this goes actually back to the David Simmons paper in a sense, in that one of the things we don't capture um, within transport modeling and appraisal routinely is the extent to which an individual scheme, but more likely a, a package of schemes or a whole program of investment might just gently push people towards or away from car, car ownership. And normally the car ownership rate in the population will be fixed from the point of view of a scheme appraisal. So one thing we don't capture, but we do look at here, is in particular how an intervention might affect those two groups of people. So that, hopefully that explains why we have a particular interest in car-owning households versus non-car-owning households. But anyway, to turn back to the, the assessment here, um, the, the way the appraisal works in practice, sorry, I've accidentally jumped, jumped a slide. Um, <laughs> Skip on, and we'll get yeah, get to the BCR. Um, no, the way it works in practice is we look at the proportion. Um, uh, essentially, we, we look at the change of accessibility on a proportional basis for these groups, and then we compare that um, <coughs> to I think the, the amount of us in the population to, to get a qualitative score for the, the extent to which this scheme is beneficial for these particular segments in. In society, and then that's overall re reported in the results of the appraisal, but doesn't directly inform the bottom line or the BCR, but is wider contextual information for the decision maker. So that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour of accessibility in the guidance in appraisal. I think it's important to note that, quite aside from, or at least aside from direct considerations of appraisal, that accessibility metrics are also useful in land use planning. So our high-level planning guidance in the UK set out by the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, so there's a typo there, um, says that local authorities have to consider uh, the demographics of the area and also the perceived changes likely to take place in, in the life of their local plans as, as they might affect the transport network. And there's quite a lot of references in this guidance um, that requires local authorities when approving um, developments to consider in some detail the accessibility impact and that includes sort of traffic impact assessments that have been mentioned um, before but also access to particular public transport nodes and provision of walk and cycling infrastructure and parking facilities so we do um, at a much more strategic or planning level um, use accessibility assessments in the UK in the planning system something I know relatively less about compared to the appraisal side but it's worth worth noting that they have a strong role to play there. Um, to give a particular example from London, so TfL has for a long time used a public transport accessibility level metric for helping to determine the level of, well, amongst other things, the level of allowable housing density. The idea being that um, locations with great public transport access can earn um, a higher density of housing, and I won't explain in detail how the PTAL score is calculated, but it's some um, inverse weighting across public transport access time. So note there, it's time to access public transport, not time to get to certain places by public transport, which distinguishes it from the accessibility measures in TAG. Um, but it does give you a metric of how well a place is connected to public transport. And it's somewhere like London, where you know local bus stops tend to be well attuned to the needs of those particular users, and where the network is highly integrated, um, it's probably reasonable to look at access to the nearest stop rather than necessarily um, looking at different destinations. Um, just some examples there of how you will get a higher PTEL score. So about obviously being, being closer to stops, but also having um, more frequent services, and um, uh, there's, there's a reliability factor as well, which accounts for the relative reliability of bus versus tube, effectively, uh, versus underground. Um, I said before, this can help inform the allowable housing density. So PTAL can go, the score itself um, can go from, you know, naught to, 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 to do at least um, 25. I think that's the old scale has been re real scaled now but think of these as sort of low medium and high levels of accessibility 
Um, and this is an example f from a London plan. Um, and this is, this is not like an exact rule, but it's a guidance um, that, you know, as the PTAL score increases, um, the, the authorities will have a tendency to permit much, much denser housing development. So there's quite a cl clear link here between the I accessibility and what might be feasible in terms of land use planning. I think that's quite a nice example of how um, these metrics can be useful in practice. Um, I'm now just going to talk a bit about some findings from a few recent research projects at the department. So two of these were really literature evidence reviews um, on a couple of different dimensions, not directly on accessibility per se, but on, on related topics. So the, the first, first of these is on access to transport and life opportunities. Um, so this was a, a literature review we finished last year. Um, it, was, it was carried out by NatSen and the University for West of England in Bristol. Um, and there was quite interesting findings here, um, some, which, some which are reported um, on this sort of level of access to cars in the UK, which is actually very high, although it is associated with income. Um, and there are a number, quite a significant number of UK adults who don't have access um, to a car, and that could contribute to sort of greater social exclusion. And while there wasn't much direct evidence for this, um, this might also have effects on well-being or the extent people which feel under strain or have, or have mental health um, issues. Um, personal car access makes it likely that someone, twice as likely that someone can access services. And the bottom there, there's a chart which shows, sorry, that's hard to see, but it really just correlates across the study period um, the, the likelihood that you over that period gained access to more places depending on whether or not you had a car and effectively those who had a car um, had much more opportunities to access new places during this study period so it looked at changes between 2011 and 2015. I think this really um, corroborates some of the stories from earlier around um, car ownership can really uh, have a strong positive impact on accessibility. Uh, the next evidence of you also um, carried out last year was on transport and inequality. Um, so here's some of the findings were a bit um, a bit starker in that actually the accessibility of the transport system can have a very strong influence on the relationship between transport and inequality. In particular, transport poverty um, can lead to the inaccessibility of certain opportunities and that can hinder development of social capital, acquiring goods and using services and possibly lead to social exclusion, um, so as, as noted there on the slide. Uh, one of the recommendations from the report was that actually a, a metric for evaluating the impact of transport policies on employment accessibility um, might be useful where there's a, sort of a, a strong ge geographical inequality in a sense between you know, different groups of dis different socioeconomic uh, levels living in different uh, different areas. So whilst transport and uh, di so social disadvantage not so while transport disadvantage and social exclusion are not necessarily synonymous, uh, we think there is an interaction between the two which can help perpetuate tr transport poverty and lead to um, some of these barriers to developing social capital, acquiring goods and services and ultimately to can possibly um, worsen social exclusion. Um, I'm finally just going to talk a bit about some ongoing and um, um, future work. So last year, um, mine and Mark's division of the DFT consulted on our priorities for developing the DFT's appraisal framework over the next three to five years. Um, one thing which, 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 which was in that consultation, which I can now sort of talk about in a bit more detail, is a, a view of social impact within TAG. And one of the social impacts which we look at is accessibility. I've already explained how accessibility is, is looked at in some of the earlier slides. Um, but I thought I'd just quickly go through some of the strong findings from what was called a SWOT analysis there. So it looked at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats around the town guidance. So actually, we think the guidance is quite strong in that it has distinct stages, multiple steps. Um, it can show how a variety of households and individuals are affected. But on the other hand, it only looks at public transport. The assessment is qualitative. <coughs> There's a large degree of judgment involved, for example, in determining the relevant destinations. 
Um, the, the researchers thought there was an opportunity to learn more from recent work um, carried out in international guidance, particularly from the US and New Zealand. So that's in particular. Yeah, that's fine. So that's in particular what's interesting out of this um, workshop, um, and potentially that you know c could be a threat as well if we're not taking into account some of this new, new research. The guidance was really sort of set up quite a while ago now uh, that might increase the scope of challenge of some of the approaches we have in there. Uh, two other themes from this appraisal modelling strategy that I think have some relevance here I'm going to talk about. So one is distributional impacts. So we are um, looking to develop a greater understanding of how to actually appraise distributional impacts, including at the national level. This is of particular interest um, at the moment because of a lot of concerns within the UK and also expressed directly by the government around rebalancing the economy and how can we rebalance the economy and what role can transport play in rebalancing the economy. Um, so some of the things we're, we're looking at in that space to try and provide the evidence base to help decision makers you know, take forward appropriate policies to do that is person-centred analysis to try and to understand much more on an individual basis how the broader aggregate appraisal impacts can affect the experiences of individual travellers. Um, this might allow us to take richer, dis undertake richer distributional assessments in the future. Um, yeah, and we talk a bit about a few other issues as well, but I'm going to move to the next slide. Just finally to finish off, um, I mentioned there was you know, some, although not consistently strong evidence, uh, on the link between poor accessibility and well-being. And that, you know, that's potentially very uh, interesting for us, particularly um, in the last few years, there has been an, an increase uh, in, in, in interest within government and pressure to government uh, around considering well-being-based approaches more in appraisal. I think if, if we do establish a strong link between accessibility and well-being, that in itself um, could be interesting and, uh, and pose a potential approach for understanding how to value accessibility in a cost-benefit analysis framework. Um, we're doing some work at the moment to um, place e economic values on you know, potential improvements to accessibility for disabled people as well as undertaking a broader review of how um, subjective well-being approaches could be useful uh, in appraisal and that includes you know, other areas such as noise but it could also be relevant for accessibility to just a nice chart there on um, relationship between life satisfaction and commute time from a 2016 again UWE study done for the department. Um, so that was a bit quick on the last two but I need to stop now so that's my and Mark's details. Um, that's it. <laughs>